got to say all that over again now. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, so we have Matt Farquhar, so founder of the, the Rossi Group. And he's, uh, he actually is also uh, uh, the author of uh, Raising Private Capital, How to Build Your Own Real Estate Empire with Other People's Money. And he has uh, done transactions and using private money and controls over 1,000 units of multifamily and has completed uh, dozens of fix and flips, office buildings, single family homes and apartment buildings. So with that, I'm going to let it on to Matt. Uh, and we, we are actually going to have an open format conversation, uh, open conversational format today. So it's a mastermind. So I would encourage everyone to um, put any questions you guys have on the chat or even better speak up. And I'm going to do the same my, myself. And let's learn as much as we can about real estate. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Stefan, for having me here. So uh, listen, guys, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, I've got a whole slew of PowerPoint presentations. And if it, if it becomes appropriate, I can bring up some stuff that I've talked about in the past at the Bigger Pockets Conference or um, webinars I've taught for them or whatever. But if it becomes appropriate, I'll bring it up. Um, but what I prefer to do uh, when I speak at events, and this is when I was speaking face-to-face -face at meetups, um, and when I speak on, on Zoom calls like this, I prefer to do my favorite talk in the world, which is called, What Do Y'all Want to Talk About? Um, so the, the way, what do y'all want to talk about goes is, uh, I just, I've been doing this for 15 years. And so there's a lot of different types of real estate transactions, a lot of things that I've seen either as a participant or, um, as an investor or as a witness or whatever real estate strategies and markets and things like that. So there's a lot of, at least peripheral conversations that I can offer. Um, and, uh, and, I've, and uh, th I think there's a lot of value that I can offer to, to a lot of different facets of it. So um, I'm happy to go in whatever direction you guys want to go in. So this is not going to be a, multi, a, a single lane conversation. This is going to be more, um, you know, pick my brain Q&A, uh, maybe go down some interesting roads and, and have some interesting conversations and we can group chat them. Um, and if folks want to add on to the conversation, we can do that. Um, that, that's, uh, that's more than fine too. What I'd like for you guys to do, we can do more than we can do this. Um, you can do one or two things. You can type a specific question, you get a specific deal or whatever. Um, you can put that in the chat box, or if you guys would like to talk about a subject matter, um, put it in the chat box. Um, I'll give you some suggested subject matters that could be really interesting. Uh, where, what does investing look like post COVID post, you know, 2020, you know, in 2021 and forward, right? That's a direction we could go. If you guys want to go there, um, we could talk about, uh, what, what is the, you know, where is the market going with regards to appreciation, uh, cash flow? We can talk about that. We could talk about markets that we're invested in. Why, um, I'd be happy to get into DeRose, some of DeRose's underwriting criteria, uh, that we use. And uh, you guys are all finance guys. So I could show you some of our underwriting and show you some deals that we're um, either in the middle of or that we've done already or whatnot. So if you guys want to go number, if you guys want to go super granular and number wise, I'll, we'll, I'll go there too. Um, I am not the underwriter on my team. I'm the team lead of my team. And I also raise the majority of the capital. We could talk about capital raising. Um, if you guys want to get, talk about getting started in real estate. If anyone this call has not done a deal yet, um, because of all the work that I've done with bigger pockets, I am really, really good at the 101 level stuff, but my company's playing at, you know, 301 kind of level. And I can talk that, but I can also do beginner level stuff too, because I do a ton of that for BP, because that's a lot of their demographic is, is that. Um, so if you're just getting going, great, let's talk about it. If you want to talk about how to finance deals, great, let's talk about it. You want to talk about using the Burr strategy over using banks, Whatever direction you guys would like to go in, I'm here to serve you um, because a lot of times that I find these speakers are going to come in with PowerPoint presentations and with, you know, uh, either agenda or what the things that they want to put out there to you guys. But I, I'd rather make it more of a, of, a, of a forward conversation that you guys can have with me and, and maybe make it more open and maybe hopefully give you guys more value. So with that, that's what I got. That's my opening spiel. And uh, let, the, let the questions begin in the chat bar. Let your fingers do the walking. If you guys would like to take your mic, to unmute your mics to talk uh, Q&A, just, um, 
it just uh, you can type that in, type in something like I have a question or whatever, and I can we can go mic off. I prefer I prefer mic off, but that's okay if you don't want to. Um, yeah, Matt, we already have a few questions on the chat. I know, I see them, man. Let's do it. Um, Maybe just get like this. All right, Nicole, my friend. Uh, so uh, Nicole, if you want to go mic off, you're more than welcome to. That is my invitation to you. Uh, Would you? Hi. Hi, Nicole. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Fantastic. Um, oh, by the way, I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, and you're going to hear them screaming and yelling and having their witchy hour, witching hour in the backyard. If you hear screaming kids, they're mine. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance for them. Um, okay. I would love to learn about your market research and how you choose markets, especially with the migrations COVID has triggered. Mm, look at you, Nicole. Interesting question. I love it. Okay. You still on? You still mic'd? I'm, I'm still here. I'm, okay, I'm cool. I got you. Uh, what do you tell me? Tell me more. Tell me more. You, I, I hear your question. I hear it. And, no. I, and I want to answer it, but I want to see if you want to add anything more to it or thoughts you have. Um, maybe markets that you're looking at or any, any, any thoughts you have on that before I jump in and give you my thoughts. Yeah, of course. So, so just to kind of give you a background on the question, um, I'm, I'm currently in Union City, New Jersey. We're seeing okay. a lot of migration outside of New York City, uh, some of which is into my area. I have a feeling mm -hmm gonna you know dwindle down and go into more suburban or quiet neighborhoods mm -hmm. um but you know i'm i'm starting to look into other markets and and figure out where else i want to look to kind of diversify my portfolio and and what type of things i should be looking for okay what size uh what's your what's your uh unit and price range that you're looking at so I've been looking at small multifamily properties. Um, so anything under four mm -hmm. and uh, my personal preference is short-term rental. So I have been targeting areas that work for that, but you know, this, I am mainly interested in buy and hold. So um, that's the ultimate objective. And mm -hmm. then um, you asked, Oh, uh, price. I've been looking around 600, um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. There's a lot to unpack there. First of all, uh, COVID, I believe, uh, and we, we can go down the rabbit hole on this one or not, if you guys want, uh, you can look at a lot of different um, movements that were happening in our world and COVID expedited almost everything that was already happening, right? Companies were starting to let their employees work from home. COVID, like, okay, you're all working from home now, right? Um, so, uh, you, know, you know, COVID uh, expedited, I think, the, and again, you can say blasphemy or whatever, but COVID migrate, COVID, I think, expedited the migration from urban core, um, from urban cities that was already going to begin happening. Um, and that's simply because of the aging of the working class in America. Um, it's my two cents that, uh, that, that folks that live in urban, you're either really young and no, and no kids, or you're much older and the kids are already out to live in an urban core, right? There are family, there are families, but they are outliers that live in urban, that, that, that live in downtown urban cores. And they're like the holdouts that like, no, oh, that's it, man. I love New York city. I want to live here forever. And I'm going to raise my kids here. Hello, high water. Right. But that's not as common as the folks that are like, yeah, I need, I'd love to have something, this thing called a yard. I'd love to have a yard that I could have that I don't, I don't have in New York City. And that's why I want to move out to the burbs, right? But COVID expedited that because of the desire for less density, right? So I think that because of those two things, because of the migration, away, because you can work, some folks that, that can work from anywhere, um, that, that are white collar can work anywhere. Um, number one, and because there is a aging millennial population that's starting to, you know, they already have settled down or already having kids or whatever, and are seeking school systems or whether, that are that were considering moving out of the city pre-COVID, uh, moving out of urban core, you're going to see a mass migration of that. And so, um, if folks work in an industry, again, there's it's a bunch of ifs, right? There, you're not going to see, everybody's not going to move up to Maine and the Poconos or anything like that because there are still going to be jobs that require folks to be in cities every here and again. Once, you know, I think that companies are going to start requiring their employees to come to the office instead of five days a week, maybe two days a week, one day a week, whatever, post-COVID, right? Um, so that, that means that areas where you are and where Stefan is investing and probably the rest of you guys, you're going to see... Um, more, uh, more development, more migration to more slightly suburban feeling areas. 
I don't know, an hour and a half or less, right? And, and I live in, in South Jersey. I, I'm sorry, I live in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I used to live in South Jersey and there is a Hamilton train station from which you can get to the downtown Manhattan to Penn Station in 51 minutes if you take the high speed line, right? So it's not just North Jersey. It's not just Union City. You guys need to look at, if you really want to look at where the New York population, let's just talk about New York City because I don't know much about Atlanta or whatever, but I've been living in the Northeast for almost my whole life. If you look at the, um, the, that, the, like the, the, the greater New York area, the, uh, I would look at where mass transit can get, like you know, where I can get to the city on mass transit in, in a reasonable amount of time. I had a friend that was a stockbroker living in Harlem, uh, moved from there to Voorhees, New Jersey, which is south of Cherry Hill all the way down. But he commutes into the city every year and again, every couple of weeks. Um, but he's able to make it happen. And he's got a big old house in a yard that, you know, he, he, he bought for like a third of what his property in Manhattan was worth, right? So people are realizing because of work, because of the change of working from home, you're going to see bigger migrations. And I would look, yes, North Jersey, yes. But people are going to realize, hey, if I go just a little bit further, I could move to Princeton or I could move to West Windsor or I could move even further south. So I, I would expand your reach to the fringes of Pennsylvania to a little further south in central Jersey if you're looking for the commuter person. Now, changing gears a little bit on you, Nicole. Um, uh, you talked about short-term rental, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I listen, I'm, I'm friends with, and I listen to the opinion of Kathy Fetke. And she has spoken a lot about this on where America is going to start migrating to. And because of COVID, people are going to seek fresh air, right? They're likely going to do less Disney and do more mountains. You know, um, they're going to, you know, they're going to do things that are less dense. Okay. Um, and, and certainly things that they can drive to versus things they can fly to. Because although airplanes are about the most sanitary thing you can get on these days, some people are skeeved out by that. And so they're not, they might not be flying anytime soon. And so if I were you and looking to do short-term rentals, I would look in the areas, in the mountainous or waterfront areas um, in the commutable area to New York, somebody could drive to within like two to three hours, right? So let's say Poconos, Jersey Shore, Hamptons, um, you know, even like Cape Cod, that whole area. Um, if I were looking at S S S STR, I would certainly be looking at those areas. The only caution I would give you, my wife and I, we go to the Poconos a lot. So I'm kind of Pocono biased, right? So we uh, were looking to buy an STR. They're called Lake Naomi, right? Beautiful community near the Kalahari thing. And Disney's looking to build a big resort there. And I highly recommend you guys look in the court where, where Route 380 and Route 80 come together is about to absolutely explode in the Poconos because Disney's spending 300 million on a big facility there right next to Kalahari. There's a lot of other, you know, Camelback's one of the biggest ski resorts there. There's a lot going on in that corridor. But the best community there is called Lake Naomi. And we already have property there. But, but Lake Naomi just cracked down huge on short-term rentals. So the biggest thing that you need to look into for anybody when you're looking into SDR is not every town or development has affinity for it, right? So the Lake Naomi community cracked down and said, okay, you're only allowed to have four short-term rentals per year. Okay. It's like, that kills it. Okay. So we're not, we're, so we're not going to do that now. Right. <laughs> like it, it certainly kills the deal. So there's other communities up there. They're not the only gig in town. Um, so I would look at drivable mountain or waterfront stuff. It, I think that that's what America is going to be seeking for the foreseeable future. Um, mm -hmm less density and look at towns that are, that have affinity for Airbnbs and not just, don't just go on Airbnb and see where the Airbnbs exist already. Look at the town codes, like, like go call the town, talk to their zoning officer. Um, look at the, look to see if they're looking to change their codes. Um, because I've had friends buy in towns where there are Airbnbs already and the town either decides to crack down or decides to start taxing you as a hotel or whatever it is they're going to do. Um, 
that you know the, the town would likely tell you what their direction is. Are they going to be more open to it or less open to it? A big area in the Poconos that has a lot of short-term rentals is Lake Paul, Lake Wampal Pack. I could not spell that for you if I tried, um, but Lake Wampal Pack has a lot of short-term rentals, and they are going to stay with the foreseeable future because that's they make a lot of money on people coming in and out. But other communities are more owner-centered. Does that so- make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's super fascinating and interesting. And thank you. But to tack on one last question on to that. Um, so just to give an example with like Jersey City, because I'm most familiar with Jersey City. Yep. But, um, you know, they, they were until recently pretty open to short term rentals and have started doing um, legislation kind of against it. Mm-hmm. My, my idea to hedge that risk is to, you know, find properties that can work both as a short term rental and a buy and hold. Mm-hmm. Anything else you would suggest to, to you know, uh, help mitigate risk there. Yeah. Um, okay. First of all, be careful with areas like Jersey City, areas like that they own because it's high density, right? Yeah. And, and, and unless people like me that live in, in, in less dense areas and I want to come and hang in the city for a, you know, a day or two to, you know, to get my fill, then th- that I'm going to be your client versus somebody that lives in the area. So you're expecting people to come to density versus run from density, right? Mm-hmm. So that's my only caution there. Um, the, it, it all goes back to the numbers about what you said about long-term versus short-term. Um, and unfortunately, um, STR opens up the possibility in, for, for rentals in areas where like it would just wouldn't exist. Let's just give you Princeton, New Jersey, for example. Princeton may sell at like seven to eight hundred thousand dollars a unit, right? Um, that certainly would not work as a as a landlorded rental property, even if rents there are three to four thousand dollars a month. But if you can get three to four hundred bucks a night in Princeton, then the conversation may work. the The, the equations I've seen in highly desirable highly desirable areas that would generate a lot of rental income from STR because they're in the middle of downtown in the middle, the, the middle of super desirable districts, they tend to not work on, on long-term rentals because the price is already high. And the only way they work is as STRs. Um, you know, the only other game you could play, and I haven't tried, I've thought about this myself, is to buy a small multi. I'll give you a perfect example. A town I love is Cape May, New Jersey, like super, super south, about as far away from you guys as you can get in New Jersey, the southernmost point of the state, right? Cape May has a lot of small multi, like two, three, four families, right? Mm -hmm. So what if you could buy a small multi in Cape May and STR, two of them, and LTR, the other two, you know? Uh, Because Cape May has a long-term residential community of people that live there, right? So maybe you buy a small multi, Nicole, and blend it, you know? Um, That would be the possibility. But I don't know if you're going to find an equation where it's going to work for either. If it does, if you find that, then the STR rental is going to smack it out of the park. Because if it works for long-term rentals, then the STR rents are going to be way more and you're going to make a ton more cash flow. So you could just find a deal that works period for a long-term rental and you cross your fingers and hope somebody will run an STR from you every here and again in a small multi. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I won't let it, I won't let it go to my head. Um, Okay. Good. Uh, That was Nicole. Okay. Justin, how are you? Where you at, Justin? Oh, I see you. Okay. Um, would you would definitely like to go over an underwriting for 30 plus unit property? It's okay. It's all good. Justin, your mug doesn't work. No problem. Um, so I can get into that. Let me, I'll, I'll take a note on that. I can either 30. Hmm. I just want you to type in there. Are we talking specific? Because 30 plus could mean 200 units or it could mean 30 units, right? So I can show you an underwriting on a 30, actually I got a 49 unit that I own and I can show you the underwriting on it uh, when we bought the property. Super, it's more basic than the underwriting on a 200 unit would be. As we, cl- we bought a 336 unit a couple months ago and that underwriting is off the charts versus what the underwriting on a you know, 30, 40, 50 unit is. And I can go into why if you want. Um, so uh, if, you, if you want to type in a little more elaboration on that question, I got your back, okay? While you're doing that, while you're typing, I'm going to jump over to Anthony. Anthony, you on? Hey, Matt. What's How's up, man? How you doing? Good, good. 
Awesome. Uh, what is the largest multi syndication deal you have done? Uh, well, 336, <laughs> funny you ask, 336 units, 18.5 million. Um, I gave me some more of these gray hairs I got and oh, <laughs> lost my mind with it, but we got it done. Um, it was eight, we raised, um, just because of the Looney Tunes world we're in, um, we had to raise all the construction dollars and the property needed a ton of work. So we uh-huh. raised 7 million to buy it. And then we raised another four and a half million to renovate it. Um, and we normally would borrow that, but because you kind of can't do that these days because the banks aren't doing as much construction financing um, on bridge or bridge loans are there, but they kind of stink. So yeah. we did a uh, agency deal and raised all the um, construction dollars. Does that make sense? Plus you got your reserves too, right? Yeah. Which is there, which is great. But now you got, you know, I mean, it's good, but and it, it's all fine, but I've got it. I now got a property that has i got an 18 i got a 100 a 336 unit that has like a 70 or eighty thousand dollar a month expense load and i've got 2.5 million dollars sitting in the bank right yeah, it's not a bad problem right but here's right. the here's here's two problems with that number one i gotta pay a pref on that money you know i have to i have to service that okay number number one number two it's dead money it's sitting there not earning me anything it's, it's sitting in a freaking checking account right I mean, you know, um, and I I can't, because of the rules around SEC and because I I can't just take it and, you know, do something else with it. It just sits there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Um, and, uh, and, and number three, it's money I'm not going to need for the next 18 months. Right. So we set up the deal to raise as we went, but it's also one of those things where like, I, you know, when they say make hay while the sun is shining. And so we were, we had money coming in. So we just kept raising because I didn't want to have to go open the gate, close the gate, open the gate, close the gate for equity. I want to just raise what we needed. So it's not a bad problem. And we underwrote the deal to service all the equity on day one, but we were hoping, uh, you know, I, I'm an optimist, right? So I was hoping, well, you know, yes, I underwrote this deal to service all the pref and to service all the debt on the first day as if I'd raised all of it. But I'm like, well, what if I don't? You know, what if I leave it a million or two short and I don't have to, and then the pref is 6%, right? So if I can save us, if I don't raise a million, then that saves me 60 grand a year, you know, to the, that, that's, that's 60,000 is right to the bottom line of the property because that's pref I don't have to service. You follow me? So, you guys got to so- treat, you got to treat, when you raise money, treat that pref is almost like a second mortgage. It's like a, it's like, it's like debt. You have to, you have to service that you're obligated to. And if you don't, if you can get the pref off the plate by either returning investor capital through a refinance or just not, not raising the money until you need it, you are saving the bottom line and that's saving investors money mostly, but it's also you too. So okay. I know this, I know that wasn't your question. Your question has to do with sec stuff and we can go there. <laughs> okay. All right. How are you able to capitalize that from an equity standpoint, 506C, 506B? Yeah, so we did a 506C, um, which is uh, a, a accredited only on that. So if you guys want, I can get into the accreditation stuff if you want. Um, just type that into the chat box and I'll answer that. But the um, we did it through a 506C. It was our first time doing a 506C. Um, interesting, you know, travel for the DeRosa group because the, because of our YouTube channel and other stuff. Um, and because th- it was our first 506 C deal, right? Um, we had, uh, let's see, webinar number one, we put the deal out on the market. Okay. Uh, didn't realize this, but something like 80% of our investor base. Um, but well, uh, before I get to that, we have webinar number one, typical in, in investor enrollment webinar is between like say 50 to 80 people, maybe, you know, and, and the, the stats are you'll convert somewhere between 10 to 20% of that. Right. Um, so webinar, no webinar number one comes out. This is like, as the world is starting to wake up after COVID, this is like July. Okay. And everybody's been sitting on their hands and quarantine and just bored. And then, and then DeRosa group rolls out with a deal. Oh my goodness. Here we go. 300 people show up for the first webinar, right? 300, right? The most we've ever had is 50 to 60 on a webinar. So I'm like, oh my goodness, we're going to raise the whole deal. And our, our race target was eight, was a 11 and a half million, right? So I'm like, this is it. We're done. We, we're, we're fully funded. Okay. Webinar, webinar to one hits, we raise 1.1 million. 
after webinar one, right? I look at the list. It was 80% non-accredited investors. And also yeah. a couple of my nosy, nosy, uh, nosy other syndicator friends that wanted to see what we were doing, right? So, because yeah, it's, you don't have to pay to be on the webinar, right? Um, and so we realized that we had to change our marketing game and change our magnetism for investors. So what we learned is that accredited investors want to have one conversation, right? And non-accredited want to have a whole different conversation. And so we've changed our, you know, the way we put ourselves out there and we've aligned with some new companies that are going to allow us to sell non-accredited shares at a thousand dollars a piece, right? So I can sell now moving forward, I can sell equity to a non-accredited investor at a thousand dollars, right? To a micro share. And they can put, they can put what they're comfortable a thousand dollars or more into the deal. And then an accredited can come in at a minimum investment of 50 K. Right. And so I can serve both markets. Um, once we figured out who was showing up for the webinars and how to change the conversation, we figured out that what, what the, what, it, what an accredited investor wanted to hear was very different conversation than what a non-accredited wanted to hear. And so we, we went from webinar one to webinar three, where we raised like four and a half million on one webinar. Um, because we changed the conversation and, and we changed our marketing and everything like that. So um, I can, of course, go there if you like too. Um, but I, I, from this point forward, I believe 506C is the way to go. Um, my guidance to you guys is if you've got a small group of investors that you want to do a small deal, let's say Stefan here wants to buy a 10 unit in Tampa, okay? He likely could pass a hat around among his network and do a 506, 506B offering you know, among his friends and family and easily syndicate that. But the point is, once you get to the point where you want to start soliciting, right, and, and doing bigger, market, bigger marketing and, and um, you know, shouting it from the mountaintop. Um, and we did LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, uh, of course, YouTube ads and shot YouTube videos about the deal. Um, and fi the 506C structure allowed us to do that. And if we weren't 506C, I couldn't have done any of those things. So questions? I know I covered a lot right there, but I have a couple of follow up, but I, Please. I don't want to. I'll speed round them. I'll speed round them. Go ahead. What do you okay. got? Okay. Um, so, question. So, you said you had a couple of webinars to raise, I think you said $11.5 million for this deal. Mm -hmm. So, you're under contract. Typically, yep. what, it's a 90 day turnaround time. Mm -hmm. So, how quickly did it take you to raise all the capital, you know, in order to make sure you close, you know? including the lender reserves and your prep to make sure everything was in place and your capital improvements had like, mm -hmm. I guess you kind of, it all just kind of just happened. It was stressful, it? but we got it done. We okay. start, we, yeah. we realized quickly that our angle of attack was not working. And so we changed it up and in about 30 days, we were able to put it together, but we had a webinar a week. Um, and, and that, so, so I, I've seen, um, people put together smaller raises in like on one to two webinars. So it's not about, yeah. it's about how deep your base is. It's about how deep your investor base is. So we can, we did it in 30 days, which is pretty common for us. Um, and we would have done it on a smaller raise if it was that with non-accredited too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 30 days is about right. If you've got a deep enough bench of investors, because if you've got the right portal, the right software, the right documentations in place for folks to sign PPMs. And if you got your, you gotta have your legal done. You, you should not be doing these webinars unless you've got your legal, at least moving, you know, like it takes, it takes weeks to get the SEC docs in place and the PPMs and stuff like that. And the worst thing you want to do is go putting something out to investors and they get their checkbook out and they can't give you anything because there's nothing for them to sign yet. Right. Cause they, and I've had people like, Hey, listen, I want to give you a hundred K. Okay, great. I want you in, give me two weeks. And then the two weeks goes up and I call them up and say, Oh, I gave that money to Joe Fairless. You know, I'm like, it's okay. He's a friend of mine. So that's, I'll, I'll let him have it. <laughs> what other any other quick questions what do you got quick one how much yeah. did you spend on marketing generally to get to the 11 million a couple grand nothing that's it with facebook Facebook's ads, cheap, man well it depends on how you, it depends on how you do facebook right i mean we did a um a, a targeted demographic and targeted geography um we, we go after medical professionals because medical professionals are um 
th- that's who we've had a lot of luck with. And there are some people on my team that are medical, medical professionals. We've learned how to speak medical professional. So we did um, a lot of our marketing in that direction. So, uh, so I, if you're going to do a super wide net, marketing can cost you a ton of money. Um, if you want, you got to get your avatar flat on who your, who your potential investor is. And it can't just be any human between the age of 18 and 85, you know, um, it, it's got to be way more drilled down than that. And the more drilled down you get, the cheaper the marketing gets. Great. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's see, getting back to Joseph. Joseph, where you at? Hey, right here. What's up, man? How are you? Hey, good. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm brand new to learning about real estate, and I only have a few grand to start with. Are there certain kind of properties you have to start off as a beginner? Okay. Hmm. All right. Uh, where, do you, where, uh, where do you live? Uh, well, so I'm actually currently in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm actually probably going to be moving where? in about where in six Kentucky? months. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Oh man. Lou moved, moved to Lexington. That's a better city. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm only good. That's where we have a bunch of our property. We, we have a, we have a bunch of properties in Lexington. All right, um, nice. It's a sleepy little town, man. Louisville's way more fun. So it know, is. <laughs> the I love it. Go have a bourbon slushy. I had a bourbon slushy when I was in Louisville the last time. I was like, Oh my goodness. Look at this. Um, oh yes. Who knew there was, <laughs> how did I live without this? Right. Um, so, yeah. um, so, Okay, great. Um, you've got a, we got a couple of grand to your name, huh? Are we literally talking like couple, like two, three, or what? What are we? Yeah, doing I mean, I'm all, I've, I mean, I've got more, but as far as the putting the real estate, I'd, I'd say probably, yeah, okay. between three, three to five. I got you. Um, okay, but uh, yeah, so I was actually looking at the other chats, and they kind of had similar questions about being brand new and where to start. Um, I'm kind of okay. in that phase where I'm. I want to get into real estate, but I'm kind of just stuck. I don't, I don't know how to make the first step. All right. <laughs> how, how old are you? I'm 28. Okay, cool. Uh, married kids? Uh, just married about a year. Oh, no congratulations. Kids. What's up, man? Thank you. Happy Appreciate anniversary. It. Um, <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Uh, okay. So, is she, has she drank the real estate Kool-Aid too? No. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. What are we gonna do about that? Uh, that's that's not gonna get you very far. So you might need yeah, to yeah yeah. Well, might have you know. slipped some of that Kool Aid into her, and you know. Um, I wonder about get, this. This is complete self promotion, but get her to listen to my wife's podcast called the Real Estate Invest Her Show, which is the journey of the real estate investing woman. Um, okay. Yeah, and here and here's why I'm saying this: the absolute best first investment for anyone. Is your own is your own residence, right? And right. so it's it's the cheapest money down. A couple grand will get you in, you know, on, on a low money. Down. Are you are you prior military? No, I'm not. Okay. No, I got it. Because you get your VA loans, no money down, right? You know, it's like right. just walk into closing with nothing but a smile and a pen, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, you could get yourself an FHA loan um, that's like three or five percent down, depending on the deal, depending on you, and like that. So my strong recommendation to you, and three to five grand might get you there, but maybe you might have to go, you have to go a few more dollars, is to buy yourself a small multi. And Louisville, there are, I mean, you know, Louisville, you got to just research the market, you know, and, and, right. and find, the, find the emerging areas and stuff like that. Um, you can email me offline and I'll connect you to, I've, we, um, we have like, I don't know, like 350 units in Lexington. But the management company that runs it for me is in is in Louisville. That's where their home office is. They oh, cool. don't manage yeah. small. They don't man. They manage like you know apartment complexes, right? So, yeah. um, but the regional manager is a good friend of mine, and she lives in Louisville. And so, if you like, I can email introduce you to her. And her name is Jody. And I could ask Jody for, hey, where's my man? My man Joseph wants to move to Louisville. Give him some good neighborhoods, you know. <laughs> um, and, awesome. and she'll she'll do that for me. So, uh, yeah. I would seek. I. Don't know. I know when I looked at properties in Louisville for bigger multi, like you know, apartment complexes, it was something like forty to fifty grand a unit. <laughs> Eat yeah, your heart okay. out in New York City. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I pay more than that for a parking spot. You yeah. know, um, so you could probably get into a small multi in Louisville for I don't know, hundred, two hundred grand. You know. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, you got to convince your your wife to be in on this, but I would. Uh, look to buy like a two, three, four family, live in one unit, rent the other ones out. 
Right. That, is, that is far and away the, the, the first best deal for anybody to do. That's, that was my first best deal. That was my first deal all the way back yep. in 2005 when I first got going. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I would strongly suggest that be your angle of attack. Yeah. You in? Okay. You in? Perfect. Talk to wifey yeah. about financial future telling Alyssa, like when she's sleeping, put on the real estate investor show in the background for like subliminal messages. Okay. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. All right. No, I'm, I'll, I'll joke it aside. Get her to read it. And, and, um, and, and one last thing is, it is, uh, is, you know, talk about what real estate investing can do for you as a, as a, as a couple and where it takes your goals long-term. Right. All, jo yeah. all joking aside. Um, right, it's about yeah. the why, right? Real estate investing is not about the, the how it's about the why. Right. Yeah. So if you get her well, on board with the why of real estate investing, she may mm -hmm. be willing to listen to you. And you never know. You might, you might, uh, you might unleash the best investor in the world by getting her on the, by getting her to drink the Kool Aid, and you guys could be like a little juggernaut power couple. You right. Know? Yeah. You never know. You never know. <laughs> no, that's right? true. That's true. I appreciate it. Cool. You're welcome, man. Uh, oh, and I, I'll give. I, I'll. Just, uh, I'm gonna put my email address in the M there. Nobody, be, nobody put me on your freaking newsletter list. Nobody, nobody starts spamming me. But if y'all got a specific question, you guys, um, <laughs> you guys want to talk about, uh, I, I, oh, geez, I just sent that to, I didn't send that to everyone. I'm sorry. I just sent that to Sharon. I think I'll send, I'll type in it again. Nobody, seriously, nobody put your mailing list or anything like that. Don't, don't be doing that kind of crazy stuff. Um, but if you guys have a specific question or specifically Joseph, you want me to introduce you to, um, to my buddy, Jody, uh, shoot me a line. There it is. Okay. All right, up to, da, 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 where are you? Joseph, Justin. Yeah, so my team and I are looking to acquire a 30 to 60 unit property, hopefully scale up in a couple of years more, you know, 30, 60. Okay, good stuff. Um, I will, let me just tell you real quick, just to monitor time, okay? Um, on 30 to 60 units, that your biggest, that you've got two big hurdles, right? You get a few hurdles. Bigger multi, you got to be concerned about ta tax reassessments because some townships reassess real estate taxes right after closing, especially like, you know, South Carolina is notorious for that. Like the, as soon as you close on a property to buy a property, they, they will change your property taxes to reflect the purchase price. You know, and a lot of brokers don't tell people that. So you end up stepping in a snake trap and all of a sudden, like, you know, your property taxes triple or something like that. So reasonable, like reasonable size multi, like you're talking First thing is, when do they reassess the real estate taxes, right? First question. Number two, um, for big multi, like the, you know, 80, 90, 100 units and above, um, we look at payroll, you know, meaning like how many people is it going to take for me to staff this place? For a 30 to 40 unit, you can't, you're not going to have staff. You can't, your property's not going to spin off enough revenue to create, to have staff, Right. So you need to come up with a really good estimate on what repair and maintenance is going to cost you, okay? Um, do not use the industry rule of thumb of $500 a door because any broker is going to tell you, oh, 500 bucks a door, that's all you need. You got to look at, you got to really, on that 30 to 60 unit, and I got burned the hard way on this thing because we bought a 49 unit out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, everybody else is Lancaster, but there they say Lancaster. And so I've learned how to say it their way. Um, so in, in Lancaster, we have a 30 to, we have a 49 unit and I, again, you know, wasn't looking at this, but I learned the hard way, something like half the HVA machine, HVAC, HVAC machines were, you know, 15 years old. So they all started crapping out on me. Um, and so within a couple of years, I'd replaced a lot of them, but that really sucked on my cash flow, and I didn't have it in my budget to replace them during ownership. So look at when you, if you look at the 30 to 60 unit and say, okay, what are going to be my, my major hurdles? Major hurdles on property are, are as follows. They are roofs, windows, HVAC, and kitchens. Okay. Um, everything, everything in a kitchen, appliances, cabinets, all that stuff. Right. And so when you are looking at a property, unless like the bones are wrong, like if you look at a property, it's got like galvanized pipe or wiring that's, that's out of code in the walls or something like that. It's going to be one of those things that I just said, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg a roof leak, you know, like super leaky windows that need to be replaced, something like that. Right. So you want to start looking at those things on the property and then figuring, okay, what's it really going to cost me to do R and M and then property management fee on down the line from there. But um, I've seen great deals that look great on paper, absolutely get 
you know, sucked out because the, 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 the owner put not enough money in the budget for R and M repair and maintenance, because you can't have on site staff a little bit bigger, 80 units, 90 units, hundred units. I can hire a maintenance tech for, I don't know, depending on the market, 40, 50, 60 grand a year. And their full-time job is to run my property. And so now I know my fixed cost for R and M. So, and I'm not saying don't buy a 30, 60 unit. I'm just saying, if you're going to do it, you've got to be able to budget for R and M and it's, it's just not a payroll number. It's going to be, you know, I've got to kind of figure where the way it comes in. Um, those are the factors for, for 30 to 60 that, that are going to make or break you. Okay. I hope that helps. Uh, okay. Naja. Where you at, Naja? I see you. Hi, Naja. How are you? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm new as well. And I would like to know if it's a good start with funding or in cash or start. No, no fun with cash, man. Money's too cheap these days, you know? Okay. And Joseph needs a loan. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on. Sorry, Joseph. I had to pick on you a little bit. All right. So um, I don't think that, uh, I mean, okay. You could buy property. Cat. Where's, where's your target market? Where are we looking? Um, I don't know. I live in Philadelphia. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, Philly, I was just there yesterday. I'm, I'm in Philly a lot. Well, I'm from Philly. I live in Willow Grove, but I, I want to buy properties in Philadelphia. Okay. I'm up in New Hope right now. Um, that's where I live. But yeah, I was in, you know, I was over by Temple uh, earlier, the, or yeah, Monday. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, uh, okay. I like Philly. Um, is, is, that what you wanna, is, that, is that the market you want to get into? Yeah. Are we anywhere. talking like downtown? Are we talking Willow Grove? Are you talking the Burbs? No, not Willow City? Grove, like North Philadelphia, anywhere except for Kensington. Why? <laughs> it's bad around Is there. It? I don't... Kensington's the yeah. next fish town, man. No, like the further bubble, up. The, like the fish like town bubble is moving that way. Near like Allegheny and Tioga, like I feel like it's more of a health risk. Like I don't feel like that would be beneficial. Okay. I got you. I got you. I remember the whole density conversation I had my, my, with, with my new best friend, Nicole, over there, you know? Um, so I like, so here's what I like. I like the burbs of Philly. I like like Bristol. Um, yeah. I like Ben Salem. I like those areas. I don't and live far from Ben Salem either. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a, a market called uh, Levittown as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Look at those markets. Cause those are, if you figure out how to fix up a Levittown house, they're all exactly the same. A guy named Levitt built all of them in like the 40s and 50s and stuff like that. They're all identical. There's like a bunch of Levitt towns. He named all these towns after himself. And they're all identical little cookie cutter houses. You figure one of them out, they look like little trailers, but you figure one of those houses out, you can do all of them. Um, they rent well and they've got yards and spaces and a lot of people commute, commute into the city. So if mm -hmm. for me, I would do more burbs, you know, um, like burbish kind of areas. Um, yeah. like, like blue call, like blue collar burb. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would do the blue collar burbs. That's what I would do. Um, and if you've got, are we talking like you've got cash? Are we talking like more than or less than a hundred K and you don't have to I mean, again, try to get into your business. What's that? No, like way less than you talk about buying cash. That's what I was asking. You know? Yeah. I don't know. I just wonder because like some people I ask, they'll say like, Stay away from loans. Don't use loans. And then other people be like, no, use, use OPM. You do that. You always get loans. So I well, wasn't you know sure. And some you know people also recommend it, you know? uh, wholesaling too. So I just uh -huh. was wondering. Some people recommend whole, like starting with wholesaling, like if you don't have a lot of money. So. Um, okay. I have my own opinion on that. A lot. There, there are folks out there talking about like, you know, like, Wholesale your way to rentals, you know, like wholesale, yeah. wholesale, buy a rental, wholesale, wholesale, buy a rental, wholesale, wholesale. I personally don't believe in that because wholesaling to be successful in it is a business. You know, if you want to wholesale, wholesale. And if you start making like all this extra cash, then maybe you throw it on to some syndications, you spin it off into other people's deals or whatever. Um, but we had the deal we just closed in North Carolina. We had a bunch of wholesalers invest with us, you know, mm -hmm. um, and these are folks that are making a bunch of money wholesaling. So I would, um, if you want to wholesale, uh, you get, it's, it's a business and you got to build it up. You got to have your marketing flat. Um, I don't recommend just doing one or two wholesales 
yeah. making a, you know, making a couple grand, you know, making 40, 50 grand and then go and taking that and throwing it into, into a real estate deal because the mechanisms you're going to have to build and the work you're going to have to do and what you're going to have to set up for yourself, must mm-hmm. well keep it going. You know, um, the guys that I, the guys and gals that I know that, you know, wholesale, wholesale, keep it wholesale, wholesale, keep it. Those folks are, they're bringing in 10, 15, 20 deals a month. Right. Um, and so if that's the path you want, your primary vehicle is wholesaling, right? So, uh, the, and again, take it from someone who now I'm here talking to y'all cause I've made all the mistakes already and now I'm successful because I learned from all mistakes and I applied what I learned and all that. Right. So if I were you, I would pick a lane and not try and do multiple lanes. If you want to be rental, then learn how to do the burr strategy. Right, buy a rental, yeah. fix it up, renovate it, refinance, repeat, do it over again. Right, do that in in the in the um in, in the blue collar birds. Right, mm-hmm. or if you, if you're if you're great at marketing, then build a marketing arm and do lots of wholesale deals. Okay, but it's got to be one or the other. Okay. All right. What do you think? If you had to pick, if you had to pick one right now, rentals or wholesale, what would it be? Rentals. Okay, then do it. Right. And, and the, the people that are telling you it's bad to borrow money, you know, didn't read rich dad, poor dad, like you and me did, you know, there's good debt and bad debt. And if you take on debt to buy yourself an asset, that's a good thing. If you take right. on debt to buy yourself a flat screen, that's bad thing. That's a bad thing. Right. right? Okay. So debt to buy an asset, as long as the assets paying you more than what the debt is, is a very good thing. Okay. Okay. You You're yeah. welcome. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see. Is it Justin? Okay. Justin, I think I already answered your question already. Um, if you want to pop, if you want to talk again, pop another question in, um, Stefan, my man, how do you say, how do you use digital marketing to raise capital? What channels do you find most productive besides webinar sessions? Uh, okay. Stefan, are you talking about like, um, social media channels? Is it you like, where do we market for social media on social media? Social media or others. So I guess first, like what are your favorite tools? Is it just Facebook ads or do you use others? And then what is your process uh, in terms of um, also tying it to the legal side, like with establishing pre-existent relationship and tying that to the digital aspects of building your email list and things like that. And then I guess third part, um, what kind of conversion rates do you see with your targeted market? Mm -hmm. Let's say once you have your, let's for example, medical professionals, you have, um, you know, 10,000 emails to <laughs> to raise uh, X amount of doors or like what kind of conversion is uh, is a good target to have. I got it. Okay. Let me, I'm, I'm going to forget half those questions. You have to ask them again. So I'll start at the top though. Um, the, my favorite digital platform is, uh, is YouTube by far. And that's because Google owns them. And that's because I've also got a, uh, you know, again, Hey, listen, I got started on YouTube before it was super popular with everybody. Right. So I started YouTubing, I think in 2014. And so, um, the, uh, Google owns YouTube. And so when you Google things that I'm involved in, you know, a lot of times we show up, right? And so I like the Google ability of YouTube. And so we use YouTube marketing to promote what we do. Um, I like Google pay per click. Um, we've tried, we've done Facebook and it's good. And it, it, you can list build with Facebook. The one thing that we've thrown a ton of money at and not gotten a nickel out of is LinkedIn, right? And people think it's like the next thing. Yeah. I don't know. I think TikTok's got a better chance to become the next thing than LinkedIn. You know, I mean, it's good. I'm just not on it as much as um, as uh, as as I as I probably should be in, in that. But we just don't. We've tried LinkedIn marketing. Um, I probably should use LinkedIn just to getting our brand out and do more posts on LinkedIn. But I don't believe that LinkedIn paid marketing has produced anything for us. Um, Google had, Google's produced a ton. YouTube, obviously, same mark, same mark, and Facebook a bit. Um, Facebook is like a, a, a lot of Facebook is going to just generate soft leads or people that are going to click on something, cost you some money and then not sign up for your list. Oh, there goes my wonderful camera. Yeah, sorry. Let's see if it fixes itself. Okay. Well, I'll just have to be blurry for a second there. Um, so, okay. Uh, that's the channel. That's the, those are the channels that we like. Uh, I, what was your next question? And while well, I'll try to fix my camera. Yes, again. So, uh, Establishing pre-existent relationship for, for like SEC purposes, let's say. 
How do you? We don't, so because we do 506C, you don't have to have a pre-existing relationship. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 506C says as long as the person is accredited and they have to prove that they're accredited and I have to verify their accreditation status, I have to do all that. That allows me to solicit, which means I'm buying rental properties and you can invest with me, right? That's solicitation. Um, so I can, uh, I, I can do that through 506C. I can't do it through B right? Through B, I can only invest with friends and family. They have to have a substantiated pre-existing relationship. And I've done a bunch of these, right? So, um, so, so that, that's all well and good, you know, but, but you can't, you, but, and for smaller, you guys should all start with 506B and then grow up to, and then grow into C as you guys scale up, if you're going to start raising capital. Um, but uh, the pre-existing, the, the substantiated pre-existing relationship, I believe the SEC does not, put true def they don't put definitions around it and that's so that they it can remain somewhat vague which it is right um so uh so that's that um what what, what was your next question yeah, the third part i mean last last part of my question was actually just for um basically if you have target conversion rates such as like for example you mentioned for the the last uh, deal that you did uh you spent a couple of thousand on facebook so like what kind of conversion rates are you working at in terms of, I guess, number of emails collected and stuff like that to convert to an actual investor? Um, it's hard to say, because for, uh, for, for, the, for the Google product, we do a lot better because we have a brand there, right? And so, um, so, so and I think that's, that's on us. So for probably, for every click that we got on Facebook, probably one in every 30 or 40, turned into a, a real lead and maybe one out of every two of those we, co we converted. Um, for YouTube and Google, for one out of every maybe five or 10 that clicked, we were able to convert. So the conversion rate on YouTube and Google was were way better um, than they were on Facebook. And LinkedIn, we just put, threw a bunch of money at it and didn't get anything back. So it's crickets lots of money and then crickets on their side youtube like to to describe so those would be people who are basically uh looking for your videos essentially like and they would google they would google something and they would find it like no you can um you can you can go top of the fold like um let's say you go on youtube and search like you know investing in apartment buildings okay i can do a it's called a discovery ad Okay, so I can do a discovery ad, which means that, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, I can do a, uh, I can do an ad that, that shows up based on, let's see, an, an apartment. I'll screen share in a second here. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. There we go. Okay. So if I, if I Google investing in apartments on YouTube, right? Um, I'm going to see these three things here. These are paid ads on YouTube. These are called discovery ads. Okay. Uh, this is going to add, 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 add. Now I can make this a video as an advertiser. I can make it a video that people have to watch all about me and why I'm amazing. Um, and then these are the true organic um, again, let's see if there's, oh, it's all great. Cardone and Brandon and, uh, 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 there he is me. Okay. So because this is, this video of mine is here because it's, it's, it shows up in the organic searches, but I can get on the paid searches up here. Right. And these don't cost much to be up here. These are like pennies, uh, to, to be in and, um, in that, cause it doesn't, it doesn't pay much until people, until people click on it. But the, the one that, um, the ads that uh, they cost a lot that I don't, I don't do, but then they cost a lot more are the ads that play before. Like if you want to watch a Graham Stephan video about real estate investing or a Brandon Turner video about real estate investing, the, you know how like, you have to watch like a little commercial before, right? Those cost a lot more um, and they can be more productive, but I find them to be kind of a nuisance and annoying in, in that, but they're, they're like high pressure, high sales. Uh, I like the discovery ads and they're very cheap in that. So that's the marketing that we do. And I do, um, I, we shot a few videos about like, Hey, you know, you guys should invest in multifamily with us. And we did paid marketing on them and they did well. So. All right. 
Thank yeah. You. But again, but again, that's that's because that's what we do, right? We're, we're producing a lot of videos, and so it was no thing for me to produce like a two minute video about why this apartment complex are investing in is amazing, right? Um, and that th- th- we shot that video, and then I did a paid marketing campaign on it, and it generated a bunch of traffic. Make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Cool. Was that helpful? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brianna, hello. I'm a sophomore in college. I love these. I, I love helping uh, younger folks get going. Um, where are you at, Brianna? I'm right here. I'm right here. Uh, I want to get started with this thing, but I'm not sure where to begin. Do you have any recommendations for me to start? Okay, cool. Um, all right. So awesome. I wish I was thinking about this kind of thing, Brianna, as a sophomore in college myself. So first of all, awesome. Kudos to you. Um, best thing that you can do is to understand that you got a long ways ahead of you. And the best thing you can do is, is here goes my camera, is gather information and collect data and get as much exposure and build your network while you're, got, while you're going now. I know probably what you think that you need to do is to go out and try and buy a 100-unit apartment building right now, but you don't have to do that. Uh, what you got to do is build your network, collect data, um, and, and build your network of people that could be potential partners or potential you know, deal finders or helpers, and also build your network, believe it or not, of potential investors. Okay, And then build that. And then get some exposure. So try an internship, right? Um, and that. What's your What's your uh, major? Um, finance and MIS, but I have a minor in real estate management and development. Okay. Have you were Have you done an internship in real estate and development yet? No, not quite yet. Okay. Where are you located? Uh, well, currently I'm in South Jersey, but I go to school in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, there's a ton, I mean, you know, you're in the, you're in the, you're in the Mecca, man. There's a ton going on in Philly. So I would try and find um, an internship with a larger outfit that you could learn the most from in development and things like that in Philadelphia, free internships. Okay. You know, um, and, and that, I mean, you could do property management too. Um, there's a lot of PM companies out there, but I would probably lean more towards development because it's just going to be more of a complex conversation and, and, you know, I'd probably give you more exposure to that kind of thing. Uh, you could also consider a commercial broker like Marcus and Millichap or a house like that, um, that may offer internships for the summer, um, uh, or something that would give you some exposure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Does that help you? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. I got you. All right. Uh, Anthony, I have a rental property. We had Anthony. What's up, man? Right at the top of the list. All right. There you go. I was hoping you were going to ask a question. I was like, look at this badass guy. Um, <laughs> right. All right. I have a rental property that I went, that I rent to a family member. Uh oh. The house is paid off. I hope you hope you got a lease, Anthony. No. Oh, man. No, uh, I can trust them. I, they're more than family. I mean, it's, it's, um, I've had family lose family because they didn't have a lease contract. I'm just saying, I'm just looking out for you. Well, it's going on three years, so they always cool. pay. All right, if they, I guess if they would have jacked you, they would have done it by now, right? So, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I bought it. I bought it and fixed it up. Cool. Uh, I lived there for a while and decided I want to move and wanted to move. I am. St- am I still able to refinance without a paper trail that I rented out? It's just a mutual agreement. Okay. Hmm. Why, uh, why do you not want to put it on a lease? I don't know. Never thought about it. Um, if you're going to refi it, you either need to refi it as your primary residence, which I don't like because that's fraud. Right. Um, and so, and I'm not calling you that I'm not throwing names out there or whatever, but like if the <laughs> bank ever be like, Hey man, you said you live here and you don't. Right. Right. Um, and this guy that doesn't have any type of proof that this is a primary residence lives here. So, I would draft up a very friendly lease contract that says how much rent your friend's paying you. Uh, if they didn't give you security deposit, put it on there. Just draft up a nice lease and then take that to your lender because your lender is going to want proof of the lease and you backdate it to when they moved in. Okay. Um, and you, and you, uh, are they paying you cash that you're depositing in the bank or are they paying you yeah, cash you're putting did. in the hip national bank or are they paying you a check? Uh, no, they, um, it's cash. It's just they give me Apple Pay, then I transfer it into my savings account, and that's just yeah. Hard. But you got a paper trail of the of the money coming in. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Um, you could uh, any lender would touch that would say, okay, you've got to you just show them. I got a paper trail. Listen, this is my friend, my cousin Johnny. He's been living here for all this time, three years. 
here's the lease, here's the paper trail, the rent coming in. Um, you could certainly refinance it, but I don't think you're gonna get a refi going without a without a lease in hand. So you're okay. gonna have to talk to your cousin Johnny about, hey man, listen, I love you like a brother, but we gotta sign a lease, okay? Um, and, and you can, and listen, well, the bank's gonna hate this, but if your friend, family member that's living there, um, uh, one that it gets skittish with something you're like, well, what if I move? Whenever, what if I want to decide I want to move out? Then you could offer them a month to month lease, but the bank is going to hate that. Okay. Right. The bank is going to look at it and say, well, you know, it's not really, it's not really long term. Whatever. I would ask whoever's living there to sign a long term lease and you make yourself a gentlewoman or a gentleman or gentlewoman's agreement that you'll let them out of their contract yeah. whenever they want to move. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah, the paper trial, I didn't think about that. Um, That's the only way to get a loan. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. Proof of, uh huh? No, I was just kind of curious because I said I didn't have a paper trail, but I guess I do in a way. And I was just figuring like a lease contract or some type of paperwork. I didn't have anything drafted up. That's what I was referring to. Uh, But great, uh, you answered my question. But um, so can I go ahead and get uh, something drafted up as a lease um, from prior from when I first rented out the house to them? Yeah, I, I would I would draft it up with the date that they moved in as okay. the lease contract date. Okay. And they should have no objection to that because they've stayed in conf- and they've they have not violated the lease as long as they've been paying you. They they've stayed within the the, the confines of the lease, so they they you, they should have no objection to you backdating it to the date that they moved in, All and right. and then you're both covered, right? Then it's like you now have proof. They have proof of residency for the last three years. Because if somebody ever came at them and said, "Hey, we need to prove you need to prove your stability," well, here is my lease. I've been in here for three years. You know, and it's true. It's not. It's not a fake document, right? It's true. They were there for three years. You should date it to the date they moved in. You know, okay. um, and, and then that's honest, right? Um, so I and then the, the bank's gonna like that too because it shows stability and shows long term tenancy and stuff like that too. So okay, right on, man. I appreciate it. Right on to you. Um, Cole. Nicole says the invest her group is amazing. I hope Liz can hear me. Um, Sharon. Hi, Matt. I am. I, you might've sent this to me direct Sharon. Um, and I don't know if I can, I, I'll, uh, I'll just read it out because I don't know. Sharon, you on the line? Uh, yes. I'm not sure if my microphone's working. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. I can hear um, you. Yeah, you can. I just didn't know how this works. But yeah, you can say it. To everyone you can say it too um so i have a question <laughs> so i was working in property management of section eight properties and recently i'm interested in buying a property or multiple properties actually i was looking at the pennsylvania area mm-hmm. um and so i just wanted to see what your suggestions are like recommendations on that and what markets in pennsylvania <laughs> Yeah, and just like Section 8 in general, Section 8 properties, if that's a good idea, which Mm -hmm. this also like, some people say it's good, some people say it's not, but. I don't, so I'm not a fan of pursuing Section 8. Um, Section 8 is a vehicle, you know, for some folks. I mean, um, the Section 8 is a double-edged sword. You know, I mean, it's not the end all be all. I mean, it, it's, it's good, stable income, um, but you deal. And I've had many, many Section 8 tenants uh, in, in our career, but we don't pursue it. You know, there are people that do, um, but I, I think that there are, you know, sometimes, sometimes Section 8 tenants can bring baggage with them. Right. Um, and it's just a, it's an awful world that our society is that folks that are lower in, lower in income tend to get exposure to other bad things like drugs and um, bad choices and crimes and things like that. Uh, and I'm not saying that any, all Section 8 tenants have this, but any Section 8 landlord will tell you that they've had that kind of thing happen regularly in their apartment. And so um, we've had a number of things of like, you know, Section 8 tenant, um, non-Section 8 relative or significant other moves in and that non-Section 8 significant other is not on the lease and that non-Section 8 tenant decides to be an awesome idea to start breeding pit bulls in the basement of the house. That happened to me. Um, and so non-Section 8 tenant you know, decides they're going to start selling heroin out of the property. That happened to me. Um, so I'm not, and we had, and then section eight tenant lives in the property forever with their daughter for the last eight years and their rent gets paid every time and, and everything's fantastic and they treat the property and they grew a garden in their backyard. Right. That happened too. 
Okay. But wouldn't, um, the, wouldn't you as a landlord have the option to, let's say, like, you have a one-year lease with them. You wouldn't yeah. be able to, like, um, tell them to leave? Wouldn't you have the right to? If For what? Have, Under what terms? It, saying, so you, don't you have the right as a landlord after the lease finishes to not renew the lease? Not in New Jersey. Okay. And what? Okay. That's the law. <laughs> Pennsylvania depends on the town. Okay. Yeah. In New Jersey, if your tenant is not in violation of the lease, you have to renew the lease. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, it depends on the town. I saw what, because I was looking into this actually like two months ago. Recently, mm -hmm. I haven't really been doing much on this. Um, but Levittown, like I heard mm -hmm. you mention before. Yeah. What about that town? I know because there's a lot of- I know very little about Levittown. I don't own there. I've done a bunch of flips in Levittown, but I've never done rental activity in Levittown. What about Jamestown, I think it's called as well? Where's Jamestown? that? Okay, I might be confused. <laughs> nah. Well, okay. the best way to find out what tenant, what, what cities, what towns landlord laws are is to call them and talk okay. to the housing officer and say- Am I allowed to terminate a lease contract even if a tenant doesn't break the lease? If a tenant hasn't broken their lease contract, can I terminate at the end of the lease? Some towns will tell you yes. Some towns will tell you no. Right? I don't believe you can do that in Philadelphia um, in that. And so it, it's a town by town thing. And in, in, the, in the whole state of New Jersey, it's something you can't do. Um, uh, you know, so it, it goes town by town. Um, it's hard to say that, you know, Tenant moves and they're, they're like technically having a non authorized, non on the lease tenant move into a property is a violation of the lease, you know. But try and enforce it, especially if you're going to do it yourself. Um, your property manager, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where it's, it's hard to enforce these things. What I would suggest is that look, pick a market first, don't pick a don't pick section eight first, pick a market that you like that you think is going to go up in value. And if a section eight tenant happens to come along, you could evaluate them based on the holistic approach versus like, I'm going to go buy a section eight and I'm going to find a town that'll, that'll let me buy a section eight. To me, section eight is a, a vehicle that some tenants use to get their rent paid. And if you pick the tenant based on the multitude of factors that you pick, like criminal background check and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then section eight just come, becomes part of the sauce, becomes part of the mix, okay? Versus pursuing it on its own. I see. Um, okay. Yeah, so let's say I have 30, 20,000 cash that I could invest in a property and I mm -hmm. want to grow it, like maybe use it like a refi afterwards. What would you recommend since you said not to go specifically for a Section 8 market? Oh, so, I, I would do the Burr strategy. Stefan's doing one? Burr stuff. What, I, I, so first of all, David Green has a book. Um, I think he sold a bajillion copies of it. So I'll, I'll sell him one more right here. Uh, look up the, 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 it's just B R R R R on, look it up on Amazon. Um, that's the name of the book. It's called the Burr strategy. It's about the stupidest name out there, but it's a really great strategy. And it's, it stands for buy, renovate, rent out, do that. Buy, renovate, rent out, refinance, repeat. So meet what right. it means is you're going to go buy a dilapidated property that you're going to buy on like auction.com. And then you're going to go and fix it up and you're going to put a tenant in there and you're going to get it nice and shiny and pretty. And then you're going to refinance it and get your initial capital back out. Plus if you have 30, 20 to 30 K, my, my guess is you're going to need to blend in either private money, which my book raising private capital will tell you how to get, or you can blend in uh, hard money, uh, which, you know, probably cost you, you know, 10 to 12% plus a couple of points mm -hmm. to get right. That's, that's okay. You know, Hard money is about as easy to get as a, <laughs> hard money is not hard to get, yeah. um, right? So you can blend it in and then refinance that property, get the hard money paid off into a bank loan at three to 4% and then get your initial capital back out. Okay. I'll definitely read that book. <laughs> sure. It's a great book and, and read my book too. Um, okay. I okay. Um, right. This is my first time in this group. So but I really enjoy this. I'm getting a lot of out of this and I'll definitely email you if you have any questions. <laughs> no <laughs> Thank problem. You. No problem. So, um, uh, and if, if you guys want to join our insiders group, uh, we have a group called insiders that I do this on a weekly basis on, um, you can, uh, this text the word DeRosa to the number six, six, eight, six, six, and you'll get a bunch of free resources and also a link to join my online insiders community, which okay. is on, um, it's a private Facebook group. So and it, it does cost money, but not much. It's like 24 bucks a month. And we do a lot. We do brain picking sessions like this on a weekly basis. Um, 
Okay, Sarah. I love Canadians. I live in Ontario, Canada. Um, hey, how are you? Oh, good. Thank you. How are you? I'm awesome. Awesome. I live in Ontario, Canada. I'm single, only 24. I want to get into long-term rentals. I buy, I'm buying a duplex from my from my parents. Mortgage from is paid off fully. How can I grow my portfolio? Mm -hmm. Cool, man. All right, you're getting started well. Are you going to live in the duplex? So I don't want to. All I don't right. want to, but I understand that I have to put it down kind of as like my primary residence. Um, you don't have to. I don't have to, but... You could buy it as a rental. You could buy your your first purchase of a property does not have to be your primary residence. I okay. just highly recommend. I recommend that it is. Okay. Um, so, um, you, are your parents going to finance it for you, or are they just going to sell it to you? Um, they're going to yeah, they're going to they're going to sell it to me. Okay, got it. They're are they going to finance it for you though, or are they going to just sell it to you and you got to come up with your own financing? Um, they're going to finance it for me as well. Oh, the whole thing. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you probably don't need to live there? Are they going to finance the whole thing? Or are they going to, are you going to have to lay some money down and, and that? Um, I don't have to No, They're going to okay, finance the whole thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't know what it's called in Canada. In Canada, the, I mean, in, in the U S um, the big thing in real estate ownership is an LLC, right? Um, I don't think in Canada it's as, it's as important or as prevalent because Canada, you guys are just more friendly with each other and you don't like to sue each other as much as people in America do. So, um, so it's not as much of a liability shelter as you need in America because in America, they'll sue me for wearing this shirt, you know, um, in Canada, you, you know, you could slip and fall in front of somebody's house and they'll give you a hug afterwards, you know, <laughs> like oh, it's, it's very not, friendly. we're known for it. Right. <laughs> so nice people. Um, so, okay. Um, the, you could hold it in your own name. You could hold it in a company. It doesn't, but it doesn't matter as much. You said you want to grow your portfolio. What does that mean to you? And what, so, what, what, what does that mean in Sarah language? To me, that would mean, obviously, I'd start off with this rental for a few years. But uh -huh. my, my question would be, how can I then, you know, get another rental property? Like, would I get like a home equity line of credit? Would I, how can I grow after I have this property? Okay. Um, Hang on one second. I'm gonna say it. All right, I'm gonna cough in your ear. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, hmm. Have you talked to your parents about an alternative strategy to this the duplex idea that they've got here? Are they do, uh, are they are they open are they open to working with you on growing your portfolio? This is so how that's I got what I wanted. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that's what I wanted. They already have a few rental properties. Uh -huh. And so I mean, they would be open to it if I if I yeah. Okay. What, what were you thinking? I got it. No, I because I this is what I did when I first got going. Mm -hmm. I bought a few properties myself and mm -hmm. then I went to my parents and they their primary residence was free and clear. Okay. And so they put a HELOC. A home equity, so it's a home equity, home equity line of credit. I'm assuming in Canada you have similar vehicles, um, yeah. in that it's not a mortgage, it's a home equity line, it's a line of credit, which is something you can use when you want and you don't want when you don't want to use it, you don't have to use it and just sits there mm -hmm. on the shelf. It doesn't cost That's any, it doesn't cost you any interest until you use it, right? Mm -hmm. So, my here's my thought, okay? Um, this will get complex. No, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, if they own other property free and clear, uh, have them put a line of credit on that property and give you access to it. And then you can maybe give them some equity and deals that you do or pay them some interest or whatever on the money or whatever, and put that money to work in deals and tap the equity. Cause the biggest thing I talk about in raising private capital is that mm -hmm. real estate equity is like an absolute untapped bank account. And so if they're selling you a duplex free and clear, um, are they going to mortgage? Are they, so they're, are they just selling you the duplex and just giving it so like selling it to you for a dollar or are they selling it to you at value and then you have to pay them a monthly payment? Try to get into your stuff. Be, here, but. No, no, I love it. I love it. Um, so yeah, so they're going to be, obviously the, the house is worth more than what they bought, but they're going to be selling it to me for like what they bought it for, which is two seventy, uh -huh. And so I'd be paying them. Yeah. Like the monthly kind of fee, monthly mortgage kind of. Okay. And it's worth more than two. What's it worth? It's around 400. Okay. Maybe a little bit more now. You could probably put a line of credit on that above yeah. their mortgage, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And tap at least 50K that you could put to work um, in that. I, I believe 
that given where you're at and, and given, I mean, are you trying to invest in Ontario? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Got mm -hmm. it. I would do the Burr strategy there. I don't know how the mortgage laws work in Canada and what the LTV laws work, but I would try and free up 50K out of the property, out of, the pro out of that duplex um, in, a, in, a, in a HELOC. If they're willing to partner with you or, or be your bank on, on new deals um, as well, uh, and, and, you know, just loan you money at a reasonable interest rate, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. maybe not like a, like a free interest rate, but you know, whatever it is, whatever the, whatever the rate works out to be, um, to do Burr strategy deals. And so that's, I've sold, I've sold two of David Green's books tonight. Right. So, <laughs> um, so look into that because you could just buy dilapidated property, uh, fix it up, rent it out, refinance it, repeat. That is the fastest way to growth. Um, <laughs> And, and so I would build yourself a little portfolio around Ontario uh, using that strategy. All right. All right. All right. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Cool. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You too. Okay. Sharon, I know this might be a little bit controversial. Ooh, I love it. Um, with the current and economic climate, is it now the best time to buy? Uh, will the prices go down more in the future due to faults or can you, or are you allowed to give up? <laughs> I'm not allowed. Uh, Big Brother's watching. Sharon, where are you at? I'm here. <laughs> okay, that, I, I can hear you. Yes. Um, I, you know, okay. I don't know. My crystal ball's broken, you know? Um, but what I do know is that we are focused on doing deals that make money today. They got a cash flow right now. And if I've got to increase rents or decrease expenses, or whatever, to make the deal work, I'm not going to do the deal right now, right? Um, and so just my, my hedge against market, markets changing is cash flow, right? And so I found, I was around in 2008 when the, you know what hit the fan, okay? And what I found is that although property, property values hit the floor and stuff that I paid like 150K for dropped down to being worth 30K, you know, woohoo. That's what I'm scared of. <laughs> but so the, here's the thing, you're, you should only be scared of that, Sharon, if you're looking to sell, okay? Though that happened to me, but I had a property that I bought, a, I, I actually bought it for like 60, paid 80 to renovate it. So I was into it for like 140K plus some closing costs and everything like that. But I was getting, it was a five bedroom, two and a half bath, gorgeous house, you know, and I was getting $1,800 a month in rent. So I was making like, you know, $250, $300 a month cash flow, right? And I was able to cash flow that property until the market came back and I sold it and made money, right? So my advice to you is I do not believe, it, 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 what I saw in, in, in 2008 and I believe that if we were to see an enormous crash, which I don't believe is going to happen, but that's just my opinion. Um, but if it did, um, it's not going to drop rents because the last time the market fell apart, it dropped prices, um, but it didn't drop rents. Because if your tenant that's living in your property loses their job, God forbid, because the bottom falls out of the market, then you can find another tenant that, that still has a job that could afford to live in your property. And I, I'm not trivializing people losing their jobs. But if that were to happen and if unemployment goes up and stock market crashes and if, 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 right, yeah. then you can find someone else who's willing to pay you the rent that you want for your property. I did not see rents take a dip at all during the last crash. Okay. Um, and so I believe that if you buy on cash flow today, it doesn't matter what the property is worth. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to hold it for long term. So if you're worried about the market crashing, put long term debt on the property so you don't have to reset. The debt doesn't reset while the market's down. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So put, you know, buy it, it cash flows, and then you, you ride out like a 10 year debt hold on the property. And yeah. then, you know, if the market crashes, Believe me, it's cyclical, right? It's I'd rather come... buy when it's in the crash. <laughs> huh? I'd rather buy it if it's in the dip than when it's high. Hey, so would I, man. But I don't <laughs> know if it's going to dip. That's the thing, you know? I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And so I, I would base it on today's performance. Um, and if it does dip, then, then, you know, feeding frenzy, man. Hop in, buy more, you know? Um, but the, what could happen is it might not dip. Because I can tell you that there are a lot of people talking about the dip, believe me, in like 2004, 2014, excuse me, 2014, 2015, people are like, oh man, the market's due. It's going to crash again. 
2016, oh man, it's going to crash. Here it goes. 2017, whoa, 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 it's going to crash. And then people didn't invest for like five years thinking the market was going right. to crash. So no, I'm not saying- I think if it's going to dip, it'll dip in the next few months. If it's not going to dip, then it won't dip at all. If that's, you got to go from your gut, right? So if that's what you believe, then right. sit and wait for a little bit, you know? Um, and, but, but at some point, you need to set, don't let your thinking the market's going gonna, market's gonna to dip be your excuse for not getting in and procrastinating because what you're talking about could turn into procrastination, which could stop you from getting in and growing, right? I'm only um, going to let it happen for a few months, not more right. <laughs> than anything. You, you're making that promise to me? You're only going to wait a few months? Yes. <laughs> I take you at your word. Okay. A few more questions. Uh, okay. And, and Stefan, I'm sorry, I'm going over time. I know we said an hour, but, uh, I'm just having fun. I hope you guys are too. Nice cool. Um, Thank you so much. You're welcome to this Levittown properties do well with section. I don't know. I don't own in Levittown. Um, but I know, but I know this, I believe there's a lot of Levittown. I believe there's a lot of section oh. eight Levittown. I know there's a ton of renter of rentals in Levittown. Again, it's blue collar burbs, right? Blue collar burbs is a great place to be a landlord because property values are going to get propped up through sales because people own in blue collar burbs, um, but they also lease in blue collar burbs and blue collar burbs are going to continue to be popular with the, with, you know, with the COVID and all the other COVID stuff happening and everything like that. You guys want to go north, go to Hartford, you know, uh, that's a blue, a that's a, Huh? With my previous boss, I worked managing a property there in Hartford. So I'm kind of familiar with the area. Yeah. Blue collar burbs, man. You know? Um, okay. Justin, question about the SEC, this property of 30, 50 units. Do we need, yeah, sure. If you're raising investors, you do need to register with the SEC. But bottom line is people put a big, a lot of fear around that. I mean, yeah. You could use an attorney, a really expensive attorney to draft up your legal agreements and stuff like that. And it could cost you tons and tons of money to draw, to draw up an attorney. But guess what? Registering your deal with the SEC as a, as a excluded deal from the SEC exclusion, from SEC regulations is free. You can do it yourself. You go on the SEC website and you register your own deal, right? Um, so yeah, registering with the SEC is, is, not, is way less of a deal than people make it. Um, and so, um, but if you hire a lawyer to draft a PPM and a big operating agreement and, and lots of paperwork, that could cost you lots of money. And we, do, we pay that for big apartment building deals. If you're buying a 30 to 50 unit with a couple of friends, then I would just have a, a lawyer draft up a reasonable LLC agreement, um, get clear on who's doing what, go to the SEC's website and register it and get on down the road. That's what I would do. Najak, is it true that when getting started up funding from the bank, you should avoid telling them that you want to invest in real estate and being you look at it as a risky business? No, man, they love real estate investors. Where are you at, Najak? Did you leave? You wouldn't dare. You still here? Okay, uh, I, I'll just say. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> there you are. All right, all right. Man, real estate, the banks love real estate investors, you know, especially if you got a reasonable track record, you got some cash in your pocket, they will certainly love uh, real estate investing. So don't, that's, that's, it's the opposite of what you would think. Um, okay. And, yeah. yeah but I mean, the loan to values have gone down. You might expect 65 to 70% loan to value these days, maybe 75, mm -hmm. certainly not 80 anymore. Um, but that's a, that, that's that, but yeah, banks do not look at it a risky business. So certainly tell them everything you're doing and don't ever lie to a lender. You know, I mean, just tell, just tell them straight up what's going on, you know? Yeah. So many people be like, well, when you go in there, don't tell them this, don't tell them that because then they're not going to give it to you. And I was like, okay, I'll see about that. The truth always finds a way, doesn't it? Truth always yeah. gets, makes its way out somehow or another, right? Don't, yeah. don't bother, man. It's just easier. You know, it's just easier to tell the truth. Um, mm -hmm. and that didn't tell you, no, it wasn't meant to be, you know? Yeah. Um, so what are the best like startup loans? Okay. Uh, two, do you have a re do you have reasonable credit? Yeah. All right. Like my personal credit. Yeah. Yeah. Like North of seven, North of 700. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, two ways, uh, go just Google zero percent interest credit card. Okay. This is a weapon of mass destruction, so be careful with it. Um, it is a 0% interest credit card where the rate is zero for like 12 to 18 months, okay? Right. Get yourself mm -hmm. one of those and take out a cash advance on it, okay? But don't do that until you got a deal, all right? And understand there's going to be fees and they might charge your rates or whatever. And the rate will probably right. go to like 18% when after the 18 months. So don't use it until you have a deal. Second thing, um, 
go to a go to find a local bank and don't be going in there and lying to them or whatever. Go in there and tell <laughs> them you want a signature loan. Okay. 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 Right? A signature loan or a business line of credit. Now you can't, you might not be able to tell them that you're going to use the money. This is not lying, but you might you might use the money for other things. You're going to yeah. tell them I need I need startup capital for my business. Well, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, I renovate houses and I'm a landlord and property manager or anything like that, right? So mm-hmm. um, you they're going they can give you somewhere between twenty five to fifty k at between four to eight percent interest. Okay. Uh, it's pretty much like a, it's, it's a personal loan against your own personal credit. Okay. And if you've got some good credit, uh, you know, credit history, you should be okay. Uh, you can just Google personal line of credit or business line of credit or whatever. There's a lot out there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and you should be able to tap between 30 to 50 K pretty easily if you have reasonable credit. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome, Naja. Uh, okay. I got two more here. Um, Tamika, you on the call? Yep, I'm here. Where you at? There you are. All right, all right. I currently own my home. I am considering renting out my home and purchasing a four unit. There you go. And living in one unit as my primary residence. Can I still access the fire? Yeah. Well, okay. When did you buy the home you're in? So I bought my house 15 years ago. Oh, uh, you are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> you could do, you could do these kinds of loans. I believe it's once a year you can do the FHA five percent down loan. Okay, okay. that's interesting because I I spoke to a um um a, a broker today and he said that the lenders would see it as a workaround to the twenty five percent the the twenty five percent down. Mm-mm. It sounded very odd. It was a mortgage broker or real estate broker. Mortgage broker. Get another mortgage broker. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Get another mortgage broker. Um, you can only have but 10 mortgages in your own personal name. So this is not the path to the kingdom for the path to freedom for you. Like don't, you don't do this. The, the more you do this, the more it's going to increase your debt to income ratio. So don't, this is not, you don't, you can't do it forever. Right. Right. Uh, do you have a mortgage on your primary? Yes. Okay. Um, hmm. So my plan was to, to, to get the, the four unit, live in it for maybe a year or so, then maybe quick claim it to like an LLC. You quit claim, I would quit, quit, quit claim the single family you live in now to an LLC and really? then refinance it in the LLC to get it out of your personal name. Hmm. Well, how would that, but will that affect my taxes in some way when I go to pay my taxes? No. You sell it to yourself for a dollar. Hmm. When you quit claim deed it, that's all that you're just moving it into your LLC. So what you want to do that that's move into the four family, right? Then move your primary into the LLC. And then in the, at the same stroke with the, with the same pen in your hand that you sign the quit claim deed on, right? Mm-hmm. Immediately at the same time, sign off on the paperwork to refinance the house. So I've, I've just refinanced my house, you know, a mm. couple months ago. Mm. Okay. How much equity you got in it? Say it again. How much equity do you have? Did you leave some equity in there? Or did you strip some? I did leave some there? equity. Um, right. There's probably about fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of equity, maybe a little bit more. Fifty, sixty thousand. Mm-hmm. Okay. What percent? Would you know what percent of the property value that is? It's not. It wasn't um, high enough to be able to take money out. It was like maybe a couple. Because I think you have to be like 85% or, or 70%, whatever the percentage is, it wasn't high enough for me to cash out. Okay, I got it. No, but you don't want to, I mean, it, this isn't a cash out play. This is just getting it off your personal credit. Got it. Right. Okay. Uh, first move, talk to a lender that's willing to play ball on the 5% FHA down, right? Mm-hmm. Move, find yourself four family, move into the four family and then play the game of getting the house out of your personal name. Got it. Okay. okay. And this is not to plug, but there's a ton of my YouTube channel about getting properties out of your personal name and into an LLC. Okay. Great plug. I'm going to watch it. Good job. <laughs> you might have to ask you to subscribe to. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right. You're welcome to me. Uh, okay. Question about lo- about location where you would hear a perspective of why is a perspective reason you own big multifamily in North Carolina. Yeah, man, we like North Carolina. Uh, we're we're, in, we're investing in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Kentucky right now because that's where the jobs are going. Um, I love the Northeast. I love snow and I love being near the beach and I love all those things. But at the end of the day, um, there's not tons and tons of factories and blue collar jobs and 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 core economy things being built here in New Jersey. This area is kind of built out already. So um, and, and also just the, the dollars per unit compared to the rent price is just not a very good spread here. 
So we prefer the Southeast. Additionally, the landlord laws are better in the Southeast. So for a lot of reasons, we're in the Carolinas. Addition, on, on top of all that, there's not as many multifamilies in the Northeast that are not like under some sort of a tax credit situation or subsidized housing or something like that. Um, there, there's a lot more just older multifamily that's, that's ripe for repositioning in the Southeast. So that's why. But no judgment. I live in this. I live in the Northeast too. Um, a few more. I'm going to do Carlos and then Nicole. And then if you guys have other questions, you can shoot me an email. Okay. Carlos, uh, you on the line? Yes, sir. Yeah. What's up, man? Uh, is it an advantage to hold a real estate license in order to invest? Next, do investors have to need a partner with a license? So certainly you don't have to partner with a licensed agent. Um, the only way uh, I would uh, I would can say that you need a license is if you're looking for supplemental income for yourself, right? Um, so if you want to make some extra cash flow, um, like quit your job, if you listen, if y'all are going to quit your job to invest in real estate full time, becoming a real estate agent is a great way to do that because you can pay your bills, keep trains running on time on doing a few deals while you build up your real estate portfolio and, and that spend part of your time brokering part of your time, uh, part of your time doing deals, right? So getting your real estate license is a good thing to do, but it's certainly not required to invest in real estate. And you certainly don't have to partner with a real estate agent to do deals. Sound good. Um, because I, I understand that if you get a license, uh, maybe it prevents you from, uh, certain things that are by by law you're not uh, not supposed to do. As an investor, you have more more freedom, maybe. No, not really. You just have to disclose it, right? So if I'm buying a property and I'm licensed, I just have to say buyer is licensed real estate agent, right? Um, you just have to disclose it and to let the person know. But you see it so often in the real estate investing world that oh, that person is an agent. Okay, fine. You know, um, I mean, you don't have to go to school for very. You got to go to school for longer to cut hair, and you then you have to do to be a, to be a real estate agent. So it's it's not a very long thing uh, to have to do in that. So it's not you don't, you have to disclose it. But I've never seen it hold anybody back. I see. Yeah. So it's not there's there's nothing you can't do. Um, I mean, you're supposed to be ethical and that's, but Hey, that's just being a good person, isn't it? You know? <laughs> All right. Last question to Nicole. Um, okay. Uh, I have to jump on another call, but so grateful. It's, uh, thank you for stuff. Oh, you're just writing nice. Thank you notes. Okay. Um, it's our Adrian. Then I'll do Adrian's question. How does a refinance in an LLC affect loan rates? Adrian, where you at? Right here. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, man. Um, I would expect to pay in like another point or so, point, point and a half, a point is like equal to 1%, right? So on, on home ownership rates, you'll see like, you know, three, like maybe high twos, low threes. Um, for an LLC mortgage, you could be in the high threes, low fours for, for small single families, small multi kind of stuff. The world changes when you get into bigger apartment buildings. Like we just bought a deal in North Carolina and we're paying 2.7%. Because it wow. just... Yeah, for yeah, that's because it's Fannie Mae. It's government backed. It's it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Those guys get into those guys do big multifamily and they do single family homes like the FHA thing that I was advising people on before. That's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the federal and the Federal Housing Authority, right? Um, but those guys also get involved in big, big, big apartment buildings. So th those same terms exist on really big stuff. Anyway, um, LLC. If you buy from a, borrow from a small community bank, you're not going to pay a ton more. You know, and it's just a couple of percent, maybe. Okay. Is that good? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Cool. Stefan, man, this has been awesome, man. You want to take us home? But th thanks, everybody. First of all, I had a great time. Um, and I'll just close it out real quick for myself. My email address is here. Please, if you guys have thoughtful questions you want to ask me, please uh, send me a thought. If you guys want to join my insiders group where we do this on a regular basis and you guys follow us or we, we follow each other around with video cameras and show real multifamily deals and give guidance and people do deals in their insiders community and stuff like that. You can just pick out your cell phone and text DeRosa to 66866 or you can go to DeRosaGroup.com forward slash insiders and I'll put that in the comment box too. You guys are more than welcome to come see us at the insiders community. That's it. Stefan, man, take it away. Great, Matt. May I just say thank you so much. It was really, really great. Thanks for putting all the time. And I think it was like super good value for everybody and for me as well. Yeah. Really appreciate it. 
It was fun. Thank yeah, you. And thanks for letting me do the Q and A thing. I, I get a lot more value out of that than I, than um, I, mean, I do PowerPoint all the time, but I'd, I'd rather do this model because I feel like it serves the community better. So, yeah. and it's just, it's just yeah. more fun for me. So. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who joined. So as, uh, as I mentioned, the video is going to be on YouTube. So I posted the link uh, for you guys. So I'm going to have it out there. Like I'm going to have the recording for you tomorrow or the day after. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody.